Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm Georgios Tsivgoulis, Professor of Neurology and Chairman of the Second Department of Neurology of National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And it's my pleasure and uh, privilege to welcome you to this uh, webinar that has been sponsored about uh, from Medronic. We're going to discuss atrial fibrillation screening in cryptogenic stroke patients from guidelines to daily practice. We have um, a very interactive uh, faculty, uh, including neurologists and cardiologists. Uh, I will be the first uh, speaker. Then I will be followed by Dr. Mutzenbach from the University Clinic for Neurology, Salzburg, Austria. And our final speaker will be Dr. Jorge Toquero from uh, Puerta de Jero University Hospital in Madrid, Spain. Dr. Toquero is a cardiologist. Dr. Mutzenbach is also a vascular neurologist. And we're looking forward to have a very interactive session and uh, highlight how we can translate the recent European Stroke Organization guidelines into clinical practice. So the topic of my lecture is International Guidelines for AF Detection Cryptogenic Stroke, a comprehensive overview. And uh, I would like to share with you my intellectual and financial disclosure slide. I wish to remind to our audience that about 88% of strokes or ischemic uh, are out of ischemic strokes, approximately three quarters or non lacunar and one quarter or lacunar strokes. Among non lacunar stroke, approximately 45% or cryptogenic, and one half of cryptogenic stroke uh, or issues, which stands for embolic stroke of undetermined source. So uh, the hypothesis was that the main mechanism behind issues was atrial fibrillation. However, this was not reproduced in clinical trials. And this is the main argument why we need prolonged cardiac monitoring in patients with cryptogenic stroke. We know that the safety profile of NOAX is not similar to antiplatelet safety profile. We know that prolonged cardiac monitoring detects PATH in a minority of issues of cryptogenic stroke patients, approximately 20 to 30 percent. We know that cardioembolism is not the only pathogenic mechanism of cerebral ischemia in issues. Practically, the most common mechanism is artery to artery uh, embolism from non stenosic atherosclerotic plaques. We know that indiscriminate anticoagulation of all issues or cardioembolic stroke patients is not supported by RCD data, and this is not cost effective. The longer we monitor for AF in cryptogenic stroke using prolonged cardiac monitoring and especially implantable loop recorders, the higher the yield for AF detection. We have a solid evidence that PATH detected with prolonged cardiac monitoring after cryptogenic stroke is not a temporal phenomenon. And there is meta-analysis evidence showing that subclinical device detected PATH predicts clinical AF and increased risk of stroke. And uh, we have emerging data for multiple meta-analysis that using prolonged cardiac monitoring for detecting AF uh, following stroke is associated with increased yield of AF detection, increased rate of oral anticoagulation, and reduced stroke risk. This is a meta-analysis that was published a couple of years ago in European Heart Journal, showing that subclinical device detected AF may predict clinical AF in pay and stroke risk in patients uh, who had uh, cardiac implantable devices. And in this meta-analysis, it was shown that subclinical AF predicted uh, the clinical AF with an odds of almost fivefold and the risk of stroke with an odds of almost twofold. Uh, this is our first meta-analysis where we wanted to evaluate the yield of prolonged cardiac monitoring for secondary stroke prevention in patients with cryptogenic stroke. We included four studies, two of them were RCTs. This is the Prisma flow chart. Uh, the two RCTs were Crystal AF and Defined AF. The two observational studies were from Brown Issues University in the US and Hospital Del Mar in Barcelona, in Spain. Prolonged cardiac monitoring was associated with a twofold increase in the yield of AF detection, twofold increase in the yield of uh, oral anticoagulation initiation, and it reduced the risk of recurrent stroke by almost 55% with a very minimal heterogeneity across trials. Uh, using current 
randomized clinical trial data, we have updated our meta-analysis, including all ischemic stroke subtypes, not only cryptogenic stroke. Uh, this meta-analysis that was recently published in Neurology included eight studies. Five of them were RCTs, three were observational studies. The sample increased to 3,000 patients almost. This is the Prisma flow chart. These are the five um, randomized control trials, Crystal AF, Embrace, Find AF, Per Diem, and Stroke AF. And the three observational studies were from Hospital Del, Del Mars, uh, the Athens Cryptogenic Stroke Registry, and uh, the Brown Issues uh, study. So we showed that again that uh, prolonged cardiac monitoring increases by uh, almost threefold the yield of AF detection, both in randomized and observational studies. It increased the yield of oral anticoagulation initiation, and it reduced the risk of recurrent stroke by 42%. However, uh, this association was barely non-significant when we evaluated the randomized control trial data. We have also performed a network meta-analysis that showed us that uh, implantable loop, loop recorders were superior to Holter or non-ILR uh, in terms of AF detection and oral anticoagulation initiation. And there was also a strong trend, which was not significant in terms of uh, stroke, recurrent stroke reduction. Uh, this paper, when it was published in Neurology, an accompanying editorial was also published that highlighted the importance of our findings in providing novel insights between uh, cryptogenic stroke and secondary stroke prevention. And the authors of this editorial highlighted that implantable loop recorders increased the yield of AF detection because they increased the duration of cardiac monitoring. However, they are associated with a lower AF-related embolic risk, and this should be taken into account when designing randomized controlled clinical trials. And finally, this is another meta-analysis for both primary and secondary stroke prevention that is going to be published in a few weeks in European Stroke Journal. It has already been accepted. Uh, we have included only randomized controlled trial data for primary and secondary prevention, seven RCTs, Crystal AF, Embrace, Find AF, Loop, Per DM, Screen AF, and Stroke AF. Our meta-analysis showed that pro uh, prolonged cardiac monitoring increased the yield of AF detection by fourfold. This was highly significant. It increased the yield of oral anticoagulation initiation by twofold. It decreased the risk of uh, first ever or recurrent stroke by 24% with zero heterogeneity across trials. And this was significant result using only randomized control trial data. And uh, this is the table highlighting uh, the fragility and the robustness of our uh, meta-analysis and of the reported associations. And if uh, we perform a subgroup analysis only for trials using implantable cardiac monitors, we see that the results are again significant and there is a, a risk reduction of first ever or recurrent stroke by 25% with zero heterogeneity across trials. So this is the graphical abstract of our paper, summarizing our main findings and concluding that prolonged cardiac monitoring may be an effective stroke prevention strategy in selected patients with non-cardiovascular risk factors, including first ever ischemic stroke. Um, what about the available uh, uh, meta-analysis? in terms of uh, primary uh, stroke prevention. This is a, a very recent meta-analysis that came out in European Heart Journal Open. And again, using data from four trials, this meta-analysis showed that uh, uh, prolonged cardiac monitoring reduces the risk of first ever stroke by 9%. And this result reached statistical significance. These are the uh, recent international recommendation during the past uh, five to six years. The first one comes from the European Society of Cardiology and highlights with a class 2A and level of evidence B that the importance of implantable loop, loop recorders in stroke patients in order to detect subclinical atrial fibrillation. And these are the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines published in 2019 both in stroke journal and in circulation. Again, a class of recommendation 2A, a level of evidence B, randomized. 
And this guideline highlights that in patients with cryptogenic stroke in whom external ambulatory monitoring is inconclusive, implantation of a loop recorder is reasonable because it can detect the risk of subclinical AF detection. These are the nice guidelines from the United Kingdom highlighting that the real link is recommended to detect subclinical atrial fibrillation after a cryptogenic stroke in uh, patients where a cardiac arrhythmic cause of stroke is suspected following a negative non-invasive ECG for a clinical atrial fibrillation. Uh, in contrast, Bioman Monitor 2 AF is not recommended because of the high uh, yield of false positive results. Now, these are the 2002 European Society of Cardiology guidelines with regard to atrial fibrillation. They have been published in European Heart Journal in 2021, and they uh, advocate that in selected stroke patients without previously known AF, additional ECG monitoring using long-term non-invasive ECG monitors or insertable cardiac monitors, implantable loop recorders, should be considered to detect AF. And they highlight that in selected stroke patients, elderly patients, patients with cardiovascular risk factors or comorbidities, patients with uh, indices of left atrial remodeling or high chest score or chest vas score should be included. These are the updated American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines for secondary stroke prevention. Again, a level evidence to a class of recommendation 2A, a level of evidence B randomized that in cryptogenic stroke patients without a contraindication to anticoagulation, long-term monitoring with either mobile cardiac outpatient telemetry or implantable loop, loop recorders should be uh, implemented in order to detect intermittent AF. And finally, this is a, a position paper from the European Society of Cardiology Working Group on uh, the accuracy and reliability of ECG monitoring in the detection of AF in cryptogenic stroke patients. I had the privilege to be one of the co-authors of this uh, recommendation uh, that was issued by a multidisciplinary team. And we have concluded that in patients with havoc score of, five, of four or higher or brown issues AF score and cryptogenic stroke, we should uh, implant and use an implantable cardiac monitoring for up to three or four years in order to detect uh, subclinical AF. And in these tables, the individual components of the HAVOC score and the brown issues AF score are shown. I wish to remind to our audience, HAVOC score 4 or higher in cryptogenic stroke indication for implantable cardiac monitoring, brown issues AF score 2 or higher, another indication for implantable cardiac monitoring. Finally, these are the very recent European Stroke Organization guidelines on screening for subclinical AF after stroke or transient ischemic attack of undetermined origin. I had the privilege to be one of the five reviewers of this recommendation. Uh, this ISO guideline was conformed according to the guideline standard operating procedure, including great methodology, formulation of predefined PICO questions, systematic reviews of both RCTs and available observational studies. And I have shared with you the meta-analysis based on which uh, these guidelines were issued. Uh, they have, uh, the authors of these guidelines have formed evidence-based recommendation and where uh, some expert context consensus statements were made, this was based on the Delphi methodology using a blinded uh, majority vote. So the first recommendation uh, that has a moderate quality of evidence and, uh, uh, and which is also has a high strength of recommendation is the following. In adult patients with ischemic stroke or TIA of undetermined origin, we recommend prolonged car cardiac monitoring instead of 24-hour monitoring to increase the detection of subclinical AF. And uh, there is an expert consensus statement that prolonged cardiac monitoring should be at least longer than 48 hours. The next evidence-based recommendation is that uh, in this specific uh, stroke or TI subgroup sub sub with cryptogenic uh, mechanism of cerebral ischemia, the authors recommend the use of additional outpatient monitoring compared with in hospital cardiac risk monitoring to increase the detection of subclinical AF. And um, they, there is an expert consensus statement that ECG monitoring, even uh, 
in this patient should be initiated during the in-hospital state in order to increase the rate of AF detection. Uh, another important re recommendation is that implantable devices, implantable loop recorders should be used in these patients instead of non-implantable devices in order to increase the detection of subclinical AF. This is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence based on uh, observational studies and non-randomized studies. Of course, at that time point, um, our updated meta-analysis was not available to the authors. Uh, and in our updated meta-analysis, there is randomized evidence that implantable cardiac monitors reduce the risk of both first ever and recurrent stroke. With regard to blood echocardiographic or electrocardiographic biomarkers, the authors recommend that they should not be used because of the limited evidence in order to avoid excluding patients from long-term ECG monitoring. Then in patients with a PFO, uh, there is continued uncertainty over the risks and benefits of the use of implantable monitor devices. And there is only an expert consensus statement that in patients who are older than 55, the author suggests prolonged cardiac monitoring for more than uh, 48 hours. And uh, in patients who are younger than 55 and PFO, um, the patients uh, suggest that they should not, they, the author suggests that they should not use implantable cardiac monitoring. However, in patients who are over than 55, after a 48-hour ECG, the author suggests that uh, in these patients, uh, they may uh, use implantable monitoring devices. So uh, there is a division based on the age criterion. Page, in a patients older than 55, then implantable uh, cardiac monitoring may and should be used. In younger patients than 55, 24-hour uh, telemetry is good enough to exclude AF. And this is an expert con consensus statement. The final conclusion of the ESO guidelines is that in patients that uh, undetermined TIA or ischemic stroke, longer duration of cardiac monitoring of more than 48 hours is strongly recommended. And if feasible, ILR is the best option in order to increase the yield of detecting subclinical AF. These are my two final concluding slides. I wish to recapitulate and uh, highlight that oral anticoagulation is contraindicated indiscriminately in issues of cryptogenic stroke patients. Subclinical device detected AF is associated with clinical AF and increased stroke risk. Prolonged cardiac monitoring is indicated in all cryptogenic stroke patients with adequate and individualized diagnostic workup. And implantable cardiac monitoring represents the diagnostic tool with the highest yield for AF detection. I think we have now strong both randomized and observational data indicating that prolonged cardiac monitoring reduces the risk of first ever and recurrent stroke. We need to keep in mind that there are multiple underlying mechanisms in issues patients uh, with substantial heterogeneity. We need an individualized diagnostic approach in this specific stroke subgroup. And I believe that implantable cardiac monitoring uh, represents uh, the best monitoring tool in order to offer a precision medicine approach in these patients. Finally, I think that implantable cardiac monitoring has further diagnostic potential in patients with large artery atherosclerosis and Leichner stroke, and further evidence will show the utility of implantable cardiac monitoring in these two stroke subgroups. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Johannes Sebastian Mutzenbach from the University Clinic for Neurology, Salzburg, Austria. His topic is neurology-led management of cryptogenic stroke patients from theory to practice. Dear colleagues, I wish you all a good evening. My name is Sebastian Mutzenbach from Salzburg, Austria. I'm privileged to give you some insights into the neurology-led management of cryptogenic stroke patients in the next 15 minutes. Here are my potential conflicts of interests. So why do we face challenges specifically in the workup of cryptogenic stroke patients? We want to provide all our patients with the best possible care, but here in particular, we encounter a patient population that is extremely heterogeneous. 
We have to respond to the needs of our patients. And to do this, we have to use the resources that are available for us. And here I'm talking about resources that our own hospital or our own country's healthcare system provides us. How is the reimbursement organized? Are all medical departments pulling in the same direction? How is the cooperation with the colleagues? And beyond that, we have to consider timelines. I would like to address these four points in my presentation. We talk about clinical aspects, challenges, and long-term monitoring, and discuss the selection of patients for insertable cardiac monitoring. Finally, I want to give you some insights into the neurologist-led management in Salzburg. How do we usually approach a diagnosis and thus a therapy? The initial contact leads us to a clinical assessment of the stroke according to the symptoms and signs with which they present. This first impression is supported by cerebral imaging showing us, hopefully, the morphologic correlate. Now we run through our standard diagnostic. And in the best case, we find a clear cause. The stroke can thus be clearly assigned. Accordingly, secondary prophylaxis is initiated. But what if um, diagnostics are unremarkable or not plausible for imaging lesions or what means standard diagnostic above all? So etiologic diagnosis has has limitation. That is why we have to keep looking. We should consider rare causes, for example, dissections, pulmonary fistulas, or Fabry disease, occult cancer. But we should also think of common causes that we just haven't been able to detect yet, the occult atrial fibrillation, for example. So a cryptogenic stroke has been a challenge for years in clinical practice, given it can represent up to 30 percent, maybe 40 percent, depending on the etiological classification used. In 2014, two opposing approaches to the, the challenge of cryptogenic stroke were proposed. On the one hand, the proportion of cryptogenic strokes should be reduced by using advanced diagnostic techniques. On the other hand, an international working group proposed a new, new clinical construct, which they called embolic stroke of undetermined source. This ESOS concept was based on the assumption that these strokes are thromboembolic and therefore would benefit from anticoagulation. This proposal prompted the development of the randomized clinical trials with which we are very familiar. However, because the RESPECT ESOS and NAVIGATE ESOS trials failed to demonstrate efficacy, the practical utility of this concept is questions because the only difference from the concept of cryptogenic stroke is the exclusion of a lacunar stroke. Therefore, ESUS remains a non-diagnosis. Ultimately, we need to make greater efforts to determine the actual cause of the stroke by using advanced diagnostic techniques. And what are the lessons learned from the CRISLAF trial? First of all, of course, ICMs are superior to standard monitoring, nearly ninefold. Second, 72% of AF patients would be missed if monitoring stopped at 30 days. So that means the longer you look, the more you find. Last, over 60% of ESOS patients did not have atrial fibrillation. The lessons learned from the ESOS trials, we should not anticoagulate simply on suspicion yeah, of embolic genesis. This means that the positive detection of atrial fibrillation has a significant consequence. My therapy changes fundamentally. Patients are typically switched from an antiplatelet to an anticoagulant. At this point, I would like to bring a brief differential diagnostic outlook we should consider the following causes. Because of the therapeutic consequence, occult atrial fibrillation is, of course, the, the main theme, our prime candidate. But there are other sources of cardioembolism with lower risk as well. And we have a risk group for paradoxical embolism, which we should put in a clinical context. 
Most substantially, however, are arteriogenic emboli, especially aortic atheromas and non-stenotic plaques. And we must also consider, of course, cancer-related causes. I would like to refer to these last two groups in further detail. The term clinical significant stenosis is generally reserved for lesions causing 15, 50% stenosis or more. But the risk of stroke is also associated with high risk or unstable plaques, irrespective of their associated degree of luminal narrowing, especially if there's evidence of ulceration, friability, intraplaque plaque hemorrhage, or superimposed thrombus. So determining which plaques are prone to rupture is an important area of stroke research. And then we have uh, aortic arteromas. So the aortic plaques over four millimeter protruding or feature mobile components have been associated with stroke and an increased risk of vascular events. Such plaques are associated with a ninefold increase in odds of ischemic stroke even after adjustment for atherosclerotic uh, risk factors. And there's a strong association with cryptogenic stroke and malignancy associated with increased severity, mortality, and rates of recurrence. But still, there is no consensus when and how evaluation of malignancy in cryptogenic stroke. Several studies have investigated clinical markers here. Yeah? First of all, especially the three territory sign, that means the presence of coincident DVE lesions in the bilateral hemisphere and posterior circulation. This is very suggestive of occult malignancy with a specificity of 96.4%. But there are also serological markers, including very high elevated DDMIA levels, so in combination of multiple territory and FOX and on imaging along with elevated data mail levels, specificity is up to 99.7%. And the positive predictive value for cancer-related stroke is 92.9%. Let us address now the issue of cryptogenic stroke and occult atrial fibrillation. We have four challenges to concern about classification, diagnostic, secondary prevention, organization. We have to be aware that the detection rate is in close correlation to the duration of the ECG monitoring, of course. And in view of the relevance of secondary prevention, there is a need to select patients better, especially patients with tryptogenic strokes. The key could be an intensification of rhythmological diagnostics. In literature, Predictors can be found in this regard. These are validated factors that are associated with atrial fibrillation. The goal is quickly defined. Define a group with high pretest probability for the detection of atrial fibrillation and ensure the most efficient use of cardiac long-term monitoring. The challenge of patient selection has already been taken up to so many working groups and scores have been created. Primarily, age has been taken into account, but also severity of stroke, general risk factors, and the localization and distribution of the infarct. But no tool served as a gold standard. The Austrian Stroke Society, in collaboration with the Austrian Society of Cardiology, checked and assessed following factors associated with atrial fibrillation. It should be noted, once again, that these factors are validated in literature. The hazard ratio ranges from 2 to 5.7. I, I would like to present now the algorithm of the Austin Stroke Society. All patients with ischemic stroke should receive stroke diagnostics, and this includes a serial 12 channel ECG in standard rhythm diagnostic at least 72 hours. If the etiology remains cryptogenic, a risk assessment is recommended. The following four predictors should be checked as described, age as strongest predictor, super, superventricular exercise and atrial runs in rhythm diagnostics, and cardiac imaging, and neuroimaging. And in case of two or more predictors, um, extended rhythm monitoring is recommended in the best case with loop recording in case of low predictors, optional non-invasive monitoring is recommended.
In Salzburg, we try to do a gapeless monitoring. So in the best case, we do implant the loop recorder in the first stationary setting. Um, it is the stroke physician um, who cares for the patient from the first moment. I tried to start the video. It's the stroke physician who plans the first diagnostic steps and implements them without delay. That means it is the stroke physician that implants also the device. And I am aware that is not a common situation in Europe. Let me explain why a department of neurology like in Salzburg and Austria is able to take the lead. First of all, the reimbursement in Austria, there's a performance oriented hospital financing. That means you get paid according to your performance. Furthermore, there is an established consensus with our cardio team. The indications for loop implantations are clearly divided. On the neurological side, there is a cryptogenic stroke, which has to be clarified as quickly as possible. On the cardiological side, there are much more complex rhythmological issues. The implantation is performed in the patient's bed in a procedure room with a wash basin similar to the requirements for placing a central venous catheter, so no problem. The nursing team is trained and assists with subsequent evaluation and let me say this, this leads to empowerment of interdisciplinary cooperation. Yeah, the blocker, the link is activated and continuously records data in loops. Normal findings are deleted repeatedly. If a defined event occurs, it is recorded in a sequence and saved. These snippets of data are now transferred via wireless connectivity from the link to the monitor with a certain period of time. The patient home monitor transmits the data to the Kerlink network and reports are created here and sent back to the user. False alerts are reduced due to artificial intelligence. This eliminates hopefully the stress of second guessing on our reviews. But all in all, this devours medical resources. This is truly one of the big blockers. The results of neurology-led management of cryptogenic stroke patients in Salzburg were recently published. 131 patients with loop due to ESOS were observed. The median implantation time after event was 20 days with a median follow-up of 504 days. In 35% uh, of cases, we detected newly atrial fibrillation. Uh, this was found with a median time of 102 days from the initial event. Now our detection rate with 31.3% after 12 months and 33.6% at 18 months was substantially higher than in Chrysler F. See the note. We observed similar predictors for atrial fibrillation after ESOS obeyed with a higher frequency than previously reported. And this study suggests that the neurologist led decision, the management and evaluation of uh, loop recorders after ESOS is uh, feasible. And to summarize, a cryptogenic stroke uh, is a clinically important stroke subtype that usually requires extensive investigation. We need to better select patients to not miss treatment options. And the neurology-led management of implantable loop recorders of these patients is feasible and goal orientated. I would like to thank my team in Salzburg for their dedication and support. Thank you very much. The final speaker is Dr. Jorge Toquero, a clinical cardiologist from uh, Madrid University Hospital. His topic is cardiology perspective about practical implementation of post-stroke screening. So good evening, everyone, and it's my true pleasure to be here and to be part of this really interesting webinar about cryptogenic stroke and the detection of atrial fibrillation. So 
we have attended to two beautiful presentations and very, very complete presentation talking about the evidence that we have and also the neurologist's point of view. And now it's my task to share with you the cardiology perspective. So these are my disclosures. And as a common thread to in the presentation, I would like to use this document, these guidelines, the European Stroke Organization guideline on a screening for subclinical electrophilation after a stroke or transient ischemic attack of undetermined origin. You know that this document was published last year. And from the abstract, well, we have very, very important information. Just reading the abstract, the main messages are there. So the authors tell us that longer duration is needed to increase the detection of subclinical atrial fibrillation. We also need to start monitoring as soon as possible and is not enough during hospitalization. So we need to continue with outpatient monitoring. And also the authors strongly recommend implantable devices. And we will see during the presentation why all this. You have seen, already seen this image, but I think it's important to emphasize that the longer you monitor your patient, the higher the interferolation burden that you are going to find, or the higher yield that you are going to have. And on this image, you can see clearly how with a 12-leaf ECG, you need a very high atrophilation burden to be able to detect atrophilation just on a conventional 12-leaf ECG. But if you use implantable devices, the yield is going to be really, really higher, even if the burden of atrophilation is lower. So it's important to keep in mind this image. So if we are not able to detect atrophilation by conventional means, let's say we have to move to external monitors or implantable loop recorders. But what is long-term monitoring? And the best definition I have found is this one for an article published in 2021 that says that everything that goes farther or beyond the standard 12-leaf ECG or 24 hours, 48 hour halter, we should consider that as long-term monitoring. So we are talking about days, weeks, months, or even years of monitoring. And the longer that we monitor, the higher the yield. Please keep that in mind. So if we move now to the 2020 guidelines of atrial fibrillation from the European Society of Cardiology is not long-term monitoring to use the blood pressure measurements, pulse palpation, intermittent ECGs, platysmography based on a small watch or with the um, phone of the patient. So all these are not long-term monitoring. It's not also the smartwatches that allow you to perform an intermittent ECG and is not also long-term monitoring the telemetry that we have in the hospital. We are talking about wearable devices. We are talking about long-term halters. We are talking about patches and also implantable devices, implantable loop recorders. And the guidelines tell us that is a class one indication to use at least 24 hours monitoring during hospitalization, followed by continuous monitoring for at least three days. And it's a 2A indication in places in which you are not able to detect interfolation to go further, to go for additional monitoring using non-invasive monitors or insertable monitors. So the question now is when and how? When do I have to start this long-term monitoring and how do I do it? And here you can see the data from the two main trials on this particular issue, the Crystal AF uh, that uses the Reveal implantable monitor and the Embrace trial using an external monitor. Both their um, trials were published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. And I would like to emphasize one difference the time from the index event, the time from the cryptogenic stroke to the implantation of the device or the use or the, of the external monitor was almost 40 days for the crystal trial, but more than two and a half months for the embrace trial. 
And they saw that, that in case of using an implantable monitor, we may find 9% of lethal fibrillation at six months, but increases to 12% at one year and even 30% at three years. And for the EMBRACE trial using an external monitor, the, the patients wear this monitor on average for three weeks and on three weeks and even four weeks, the rate of interfolation detection was around 14 to 15%. So at the first look, you may think that external monitor is more efficient in detecting interfolation, but keep in mind one of the major differences in these, huh, comparing these two trials, that is a in embrace trial, the average age of the population included was 11 years older compared to the crystal population. And probably that's the main explanation for this difference. Do we have any trial really comparing the different monitors, external monitors comparing to implantable devices? This is one of the few trials that I have found, and it, this is not cryptogenetic stroke. So it's a small population, only 32 patients for one institution, and it's not a randomized trial. But what they did is in paroxysmal interfibrillation patients pending ablation, while they were in the waiting list, they used one of these devices at the discretion of the physician, implantable device for three months or an external monitor for 14 days. And they found the same amount of interfibrillation episodes. And most importantly, the time to first detection of interfibrillation was exactly the same. So the authors conclude that they are equivalent in sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. But remember, this is not cryptogenic stroke population. This is patients pending ablation for interfibrillation, and this is not a randomized trial. Keep in mind, we have said about timing from the index event when we start this long-term monitor. And this is another publication of 2020 in which the authors compare an historical cohort in which they really look for interfibrillation by using ECG, continuous monitoring, daily ECG during hospitalization. And after that, the patient was were followed at three, six, 12 months and every six months after that. And then compared to a new cohort, let's say a prospective cohort in which they use what they call a very early, ultra early implantable devices tragedy in which the device was implanted during the index hospitalization. And what they saw is that with this new prospective core implanted the device during the hospitalization, the rate of detection of interfibrillation was not different during admission, but was almost three times higher during follow-up. So very, very early implantation of this implantable monitor is going to really help you to detect interfibrillation. And also they were able to demonstrate stroke recurrence in these patients in which they use this ultra early strategy of implanting the device. Let's go back uh, to the guidelines and see what do they say about when and how to monitor these patients. And you have seen this information on the first presentation. I just want to summarize that the authors of these guidelines tell us that we have to use prolonged monitoring. It's not enough 24 hours or 48 hours. We have to start it in hospital, but later on continue as an outpatient basis. And finally, they strongly recommend implantable devices to increase the yield and the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So prolonged monitoring, you have to start early and continue on an outpatient basis. And finally, always keep in mind the, 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 the rate and the, the higher atrial fibrillation detection that you are going to have by using implantable devices. This is something that has been translated to different protocols. For example, in this publication also from last year, the authors states that they 
really perform a complete study during hospitalization, including brain imaging, vascular imaging, ECG, continuous monitoring, telemetry, and echocardiogram. And after this workup, if finally they conclude this is an ASUS, they use a halter for three days from at least 72 hours. And if not atrial fibrillation detected, then they use different score risk to try to define the risk of developing atrial fibrillation or to demonstrate atrial fibrillation during follow-up. If the risk is high, then they move to long-term monitoring by using external devices or implanted devices. But even if the patients with low risk, they continue the follow-up and they recommend to re-examine the risk of this patient periodically. So if the risk increases, once again, think about long-term monitoring by using an external device or even an implantable device. We in Spain are oh, five different hospitals in 2012 and six hospitals in 2017. Combining one cardiologist and one neurologist tried to put together serial recommendation of long-term monitoring after cryptogenic stroke. And this is the algorithm that we suggested at that time. Here we still included the halter, the 24-hour halter, but during the test, we encourage to think about external monitoring for one month or implantable device. And we recommend three different variables or three different factors to, to try to help you in decide which one of them. First one, time from the index event, from the stroke. If this is more than two months, then you should think about an implantable device. Also by using different scores like the Havoc score, you may think about the probability of finding atrial fibrillation early during your monitoring time. So if the probability is high, you can go for an external monitoring, but if the probability at the beginning is low, it's better to go for an implantable device again. And the third factor is patient collaboration, because even if it is not so important, you need some kind of collaboration from the patient when dealing with external monitors. And this collaboration goes to almost nothing with implantable devices. So this is our pathway at my institution at Puerto de Hierro Hospital in Madrid. During the hospitalization, we use serial ECGs every day that the patient is admitted in the hospital, continuous telemetry at the stroke unit, and at least one 24-hour halter. If everything is negative, then we move to an external monitor. Nubo is the one that we use at our institution for one month. And if we are not able to detect it a fibrillation, then we move to an implantable device, to a reveal device for at least three years. And I want to insist on the importance of timing here because we have analyzed our population and these data are pending publication, but we have analyzed more than 200 patients in which we use this external monitor trying to compare the timing. Oh, and we divided the population in three, depending on if we were able to put the device in place in the first 10 days after the index event, from 10 days to 30 days or more than one month after the stroke and see the huge difference. There is no difference in between less than 10 days and 10 to 30. The rate is almost 18%, but it decreases dramatically to 2.2% when we put the, de the device in place one month after the event. So it's very, very important to start your long-term monitoring early after the stroke, early after the index event. And now, since summer, we have even go farther by using this Nubo Home system in which you can request the test and then the system is going to contact the patient to support the monitoring and to send you the final report because we realize that as soon as we need more and more devices because the number of patients is increasing, our timing were 
more delayed. So we were reducing our probability of detecting atrial fibrillation. By using this system, you can request on the website the monitoring. Then the new system is going to contact the patient to arrange the device shipping. The patient receives the material, and then by a video call, they are going to guide your patient on how to use the system. And then they are going to recover all the system and send you the final report with the atrial fibrillation findings or not. And what about our implantable device pathway? When we move to an implantable device to reveal in our experience, how do we use that? First, the indication is done in collaboration by cardiologists and neurologists. And many times in gray areas, in patients in which it's not so clear what system is going to benefit the most the patient, then we discuss about the patient. The, we discuss about the timing, the factor, the risk factors that this patient has to detect atrial fibrillation. And then we decide <clears throat> to go to the implantation. The implantation is performed usually many times in the death of the patient. But usually what we use is our day hospital that we serve hemodynamics and the arrhythmia unit. And there we have four different beds with the patient. Uh, the implantation takes less than 10 minutes. So the patient comes from the neurology ward, the implantation is performed and then go back to the neurology ward. You have seen a video about the implantation. Trust me when I say that it's less than 10 minutes procedure. It's a very, very straightforward, very easy procedure. The device is subcutaneously implanted and it's something that is done in less than 10 minutes. And after that, in every single implantable device, we follow up the device remotely. So oh, once we have implanted the device, the patient also receives one monitor to keep at home and to receive the information and transmit the information from home. So the, the monitor receive wirelessly from the implantable device, all the information and then transmit to our website in which in our case and in our experience, we have a dedicated technician that reviews the reports that we receive. And these are the different type of reports. You may have summary report every month. You may have a full report if you ask the patient to do a manual transmission, but the important thing probably is here that the system is going to alert you as soon as you have a nitrofilation episodes. And now with the linked two devices that are based on the smartphone of the patient, this can be really, really fast. So you can really save time in detecting a fibrillation and save time in initiation the, the proper treatment. And that's something that we were able to demonstrate years ago that by using the implantable device and the remote monitor, we were able to significantly reduce the time to diagnosis and also to reduce the time to treatment. So I would like to end by emphasizing these three main ideas. Monitorization after a cryogenic stroke has to be prolonged. And the longer that you monitor the patient, the higher is the yield, and the higher is the rate of interferolation that you are going to detect. It's very, very important. And I've tried to show you several data emphasizing how important it is to start early after the stroke, after the index event, you have to really monitor your patient early. And also you have to continue in an outpatient patient. It's not enough with monitoring your patient during just during hospitalization. And finally, I will strongly recommend to keep in mind implantable devices. If everything that you have used before is negative and you haven't been able to detect atrial fibrillation, Keep in mind implantable devices that are really easy to use, easy to implant, and easy to follow, especially if you use remote monitoring. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And we are open now for your questions.
Sure. The question is, could you recap on the age group that would benefit from ILR? Is there an indication for ILR in issues patients younger than 60 years old without ECG abnormalities or cardiac structure anomalies in heart ultrasound? Okay. Thank you very much for this question. So we have to remember that um, a very big portion of patients with ESOs uh, do not have atrial fibrillation, and especially young ones. So the key word is sophisticated diagnostic, and this could go in every direction. I do not have to implantate. I, I can also do some other sophisticated uh, diagnostic. So if the patient is, is very young, uh, the patient is under 60, um, and uh, do not have any other pre-markers, I wouldn't, I wouldn't implant. I would do not implant. Okay, clear answer. Thank you for that. Second question, who follows up on link monitor once neurology team put in if patients has other arrhythmias apart from AFib? Uh, here's the 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 key, um, the interdisciplinarity between cardiology and neurology. So, so we do monitor the patients and uh, if we have some ECG findings that are worth to discuss with our cardiologists, so we do it. And it's very easily to transfer the access from the care link network to the cardiology. So uh, in approximately um, 6%, we have to do this. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to the third speaker, Dr. Tokero. The first question is, what is in your experience the value to be assigned to BMP in increasing the suspicions of covert AF? And it has a second part. Do you use scoring systems, for instance, AF issue score, to identify candidates for a loop recorder implant? Jorge. Thank you very much, Georgios, and it's a very good question also. Of course, there are other factors that increase the risk of atrial fibrillation, and BMP is one of them. So the higher the value, the higher is the risk of atrial fibrillation during follow-up. And that's also true for other scores. Huh? So for example, in our institution, we tend to use the HAVOC score, huh? so including the age of the patient, if the patient has hypertension or not, if there is any valvulopathy or coronary pariopathy or something like that, huh? then there is another factors that collaborate in the risk of atrial fibrillation of the patient. And also that's something that has to be included in your mind when deciding to use an implantable device to look for it a fibrillation. Okay. Second question. How do you ensure that the patient with a negative patch finding still get followed to get a link? Is it a risk identified? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes. How do you ensure that the patient with a negative patch finding still gets followed up to get a link? Is it a risk identified? In our institution, as Sebastian was saying, the important thing is to collaborate uh, between neurologists and cardiologists. So even if you have negative findings, but because of the risk scores that we were talking about, you still think that this patient needs to be followed and needs to be on an um, implantable device or an external monitor, what we do is to talk um, between cardiologists and neurologists and to try to, 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 to discuss patient by patient in case that you have doubts or patients in which you may think that the risk is really high, I strongly recommend to go further and looking for interfolation. So you have to talk uh, with your cardiologists or we cardiologists have to talk with our neurologists to try to coordinate our efforts in pursuing atrial fibrillation. Yes, I think this is a very uh, comprehensive answer. And I think there was an issue with my mic when I answered the first four questions, so I will uh, respond to them uh, briefly. The first question that was addressed to me is for how long after a presumed embolic stroke should we search for AFib? And uh, my uh, response to that is based on the presentation of Jorge Tojero, who also highlighted that the longer the duration, the higher the yield of AF detection. We have conducted a meta-analysis showing that uh, uh, prolonged duration of monitoring is the most 
important and stronger predictor of higher yield of AF detection followed by age. If you monitor with uh, implantable loop recorders for six months, the yield of AF detection is 4%. If you monitor for more than 24 months, this goes up to almost 24%. So this, these are some numbers to take home with you. Uh, the second question is, which is your point of view on low burden AF, meaning short or very short duration, less than 30 seconds, on several AF runs, which are often detected during in-hospital cardiac monitoring in patients with embolic stroke? I think that this is not strong evidence for uh, subclinical AF or paroxysmal AF. And in these patients, with these ECG findings, we need to implant and use the link that has a uh, lowest uh, uh, yield of AF detection of two minutes uh, in order to double check and verify uh, the existence of subclinical AF. Uh, the third question is, does the duration of paroxysmal AF detected using prolonged monitoring influence stroke risk? Yes, it does. There are multiple studies showing that if you have multiple episodes of subclinical AF detected with uh, implantable cardiac monitors, this is associated with high risk of recurrent stroke. And the last question is, whilst prolonged monitoring is no doubt best what is the time frame when this should be done after a stroke should this be within two weeks or can we wait longer due to logistical issues so again i would like to refer you to our meta-analysis published in journal of stroke we have evaluated whether patients who have been implanted within the first four weeks following stroke onset have the similar risk of af detection compared to patients who have been implanted after four weeks following the index stroke, and the yield of AF detection was identical in both groups. This translates into clinical practice that if somebody has logistical issues in his or her center, then this is not a big problem. The logistical issue should be resolved and the implantation can be done at the outpatient clinical setting after three or four weeks following uh, the index stroke. And uh, after having answered uh, the last question, I would like to thank all our participants. I would like also to thank uh, the Medronic for this uh, opportunity and this educational webinar. And I would also like to thank personally my two colleagues for their excellent uh, speeches and discussion, Dr. Jorge Toquero and Dr. Sebastian Muchambach. And I would like to uh, wish you a nice evening. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Tsefkoulis. Thank you, Jorge Tokero. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.